Thank you, gentlemen, for calling our hearts to God in worship this morning. Appreciate it so much. Let's pray together before we get into God's word. Father, we thank you for gathering us together in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Lord, our Shepherd, our Savior, our Prince of Peace, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords, to whom we bow our knees and our heart, our hearts this morning. We thank you for the privilege of coming before you and we're so grateful that you have given us this love letter that we call the Bible, this amazing history, his story, the story of all the great and awesome mercy and patience and goodness of our God. And we revel in it and we appreciate it and we love it so much. And we thank you for what we will read uh, this morning from this book of Daniel. Instruct us, encourage us, teach us, lift our hearts, cause us to get a bit of a sense of what Daniel saw in those visions. And may we tremble before you, bow before you, and let you be our Lord and our Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I am discovering why one of Joshua's Bible college professors had him as a teaching assistant. You just give him an assignment, and he tackles it, and what he comes up with is pretty amazing. So some time ago, I asked Joshua if he could create some PowerPoint slides that would give us a bit of an illustration, a visual timeline of the book of Daniel. And look what he came up with. Here's the first slide. Isn't that amazing? It illustrates some of the major events during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. You might remember in chapter 1, the exiles from Jerusalem, including Daniel and his friends, are taken into captivity by the Babylonians, and that exile would last for 70 years, exactly what was prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 25. And Daniel and his friends, while they're there, they refuse to be defined by their culture, and they refuse to be defiled by their culture. What an incredible testimony those young men had in that age of difficulty and confinement. And what they did was in direct contrast almost to the nation of Israel, who though being called out to be God's people, repeatedly adopted the behavior of their pagan neighbors. God had to discipline them severely and harshly for their brazen iniquity. And he brought them one time under the bondage of Egypt and here in this story, again, under the bondage to the Babylonians. And as we will see, he will bring them once again under the bondage of a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. In chapter 2, we have, of course, the story of Nebuchadnezzar's worst nightmare of this great statue. I've tried to illustrate this on the banner on the uh, west wall of our building here, the auditorium. And in uh, the head of gold represented Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire. The arms and the chests of, of silver represent the Medo-Persian empire. The torso and the thighs of bronze represented the Grecian empire. And the feet and the ten toes represent the clay and the iron empire of Rome. Now, from the human perspective, that looks pretty impressive. And these four empires were incredibly impressive from the human perspective. But as we saw in chapter 7, from God's perspective, he viewed this in an entirely different way. And he saw these empires for who they were 
incredibly beastly empires. In chapter 6, or pardon me, 3, in defiance of God, Nebuchadnezzar builds this amazing towering golden statue in his own likeness. And he issues a decree that everybody should bow down and worship it or be roasted alive in a fiery furnace. In chapter 4, we give that picture. We get a bit of a picture of God's heart, God's incredible heart for Nebuchadnezzar. We witness the lengths to which God would go to try to bring Nebuchadnezzar into a relationship with himself. And at the height of his absolute defiance of God, God would humiliate him. He would give him a spirit of madness and reduce him to a beast living in a field for the next seven years. In his humiliating circumstances, Nebuchadnezzar finally cries out to God. And can you believe it? That God would let that guy regain his throne and his kingdom? That's what happened. God in his mercy forgives and restores us, even when we're very beastly. Not long after, of course, Nebuchadnezzar dies. His kingdom is overrun by the Medo-Persian Empire, just as it was foretold. So in this second slide that Joshua created, following the death of Nebuchadnezzar, there's about a 25-year period of instability in the Babylonian kingdom. There's all kinds of deceit and competition. Uh, uh, competitiveness and conspiracy to see who could be the next in charge and take over from Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel left no record of those kind of events, so we don't know too much about them. Chapter 5 records the short reign of Belshazzar. Belshazzar was every bit as proud and defiant as Nebuchadnezzar was, with one major exception. Because after God wrote his fate on the wall in big, bold print, he didn't get the message. He didn't respond in humility. And so God had to take him out. His kingdom was taken from him. His life was taken from him. Now, you need to know that when we get into chapter 8 today, uh, during the first year of Belshazzar's reign was when Daniel had the vision of the four beasts. That's recorded in chapter 4. And it was during the reign, the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, that Daniel had the vision of the ram and the goat that is recorded in chapter 8, which we will get to in a bit. Now, this is a bit of a map that illustrates the extent to the Babylonian Empire, extend it um, westward from Babylon all the way to Turkey and southward as far as to Egypt. This next slide shows you a little bit of the timeline of Darius the Mede. Chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9 take place during his reign. The well-known story of Daniel and the lion's dead takes place during the time of Darius. And then we skip, we'll get to these eventually, chapters 10, 11, and 12. They, they take place during the reign of Cyrus of Persia. And as I said, we will get to them in the near future. And if you take a look at this little map, it shows you a little bit of the territory of the Persian Empire stretching all the way to the east, uh, to the west. And some of the names of those countries are, the current names are, written in red on that slide. Chapter 7. Now look at that map, by the way, and you see all the arrows going from the east to the west. Now watch what happens here. It's a sudden and remarkable change of events because for one of the first times in history, a mighty, swift, moving empire from the west moves eastward and southward and conquers everything in its path. That empire would later be overtaken by the mighty Roman Empire, and we see the extent of the Roman Empire in this last map. 
By the second century, the Roman Empire had become one of the largest and one of the longest lasting empires in the world. But as we know, that empire too came to an end. Now we, we get into chapter 8. There's a number of features that I just want to point out before we start getting into chapter 8. Here's some of the features. One of it is it is written in Hebrew. Daniel chapter 2 to 7 were all written in Aramaic because they focused on the pagan nation of Babylon. And they were written for that audience. But when you get to chapter 8 through 12, it's written in Hebrew because the focus now shifts to Israel, to the Jews, to God's people. Another feature about this chapter is it expands on Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the rise and the fall of these four great empires that he recorded in chapter 2. So it's going to expand on that. Furthermore, it expands on the vision of the four beastly empires recorded in chapter 7. And what it does is it specifically begins to focus on the second and the third empire of that great vision of Daniel. The empires of medial Persia, Persia, and Greece. The Greek empire, also known as a leopard, is also symbolized in chapter 8 as a goat. And this chapter is really kind of like a double prophecy. It has both a near fulfillment and a distant one. And we're going to have to see that as we read it and study it this morning. Another feature about this particular chapter is the division of the four beasts, we're told, at the end of chapter 28, greatly troubled Daniel when he saw those four beasts, when he saw these beastly empires coming against God and God's people. And we find the same thing right at the end of chapter 8, where Daniel is greatly troubled after he sees this vision of the ram and the goat. And here's my personal take on it. I think Daniel was weeping after these two extraordinary visions. I think he, he was getting a glimpse of what God would have to do to get a hold of the hearts of the nation of Israel. And I think he was weeping because it was so intense. He had to do such, take such drastic steps to try to turn his own people back to himself. And I think he is weeping because they ignored it. They didn't get the message. And I think he found it deeply troubling. And so it was. And so it is. I think we should find it deeply troubling. That we should weep when God is working so hard to get a hold of our hearts and we ignore him. Now the great thing about Daniel's vision recorded in chapter 8 is it includes a pretty precise interpretation. And it doesn't really take a whole lot of guesswork about what's going on. So in that vein, we're going to get into it and explore it together. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 8. And I'm going to begin with verse number 1. Verses 1 and 2, chapter 8 of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. And I saw in the vision... Uh, the first vision that he saw was these four beasts. And now he's describing the second one. And I saw in this vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Sushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision that I was by the river Eula. So he's recording a vision that he had about 11 years earlier in the third reign of King Belshazzar. And it appears 
that somehow he is transported in the spirit to the citadel in Shushan, also known as Susa. Susa would become the capital of the Persian Empire. And it was the home of Nehemiah and also of Queen Esther. So, you know, if you want to get a little bit more background on that incredible place, read those two books, Nehemiah and Esther, the wife of King Xerxes. Now, then he gets into the prophets, uh, the prophecies. And here's the first one that comes up in verse number three. It's a prophecy of the ram with two horns. Then I looked at my eyes and I saw there standing beside the river was a ram with two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher one came up at last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand it. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. Well, who's the ram? Well, you just need to read down to verse number 20, and here's the answer. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. That's the ram. It corresponds to the silver arms and chest of Nehemiah's, or of, of, probably of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, and it also corresponds to the bearer in Daniel's vision in chapter 7. And the ram, of course, has been a symbol of the Persian Empire as far back as 600 B.C. The horn that is higher than the other corresponds to the Persian Empire that became the dominant of those two empires. So that's the first prophecy. Here's the second part of it. The prophecy of the goat, verse number five. And I was, as I was considering this male goat, a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which, had, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram, he was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. So who's the ram? I'll go down to verse number 21, and you find out who the ram is. Verse 21, the male goat, pardon me, who's the goat? The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. So the goat is a symbol of the Grecian empire, which is illustrated in our statue over there. It corresponds to the bronze torso and the thighs in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, and it also co corresponds to the leopard in Daniel's vision in chapter 7. Now, there's kind of an interesting legend about this goat and how this got attached to the nation of Greece. And apparently there was a whole bunch of nomads in the northern part of Greece, and they were looking for a place, a land to occupy, a place to stay and to occupy. And the story goes that they were instructed by some kind of mysterious oracle to follow a goat. And when the goat stopped and started to graze, that's the place that they would call home. Well, the goat stopped, and that's where they settled, and they called the place Aegea, meaning goat, the goat city. So that's how this incredible nation gets the title of the goat. And to this day, there is a sea, of course, that you might know of between Greece and Turkey. And it is called to this day, the Aegean Sea, the goat sea. 
Daniel describes this goat empire of Greece as coming from the west at such great speed that it looked like it was just flying without even touching the ground. In verse number 21, the goat is said to have had a large horn representing the first king of that Grecian empire. Now, we're, we're not told specifically in this passage who it is, but historians and biblical scholars are alike believe this to be Alexander the Great. Now, you might have noticed at the beginning of this, I titled this sermon, The Triple A Threat. And here's the first A, Alexander. Alexander the Great. He's born in 346 B.C., the city of Philippi, where Paul later baptized Lydia and ended up in prison with Silas, is named after his father, Philip. Now, who would have imagined? Who would have imagined that the gospel would arise, uh, arrive in Philippi some 390 years after Alexander? But it did. God still loved these people. Now, in his youth, Alexander was tutored by a great philosopher by the name of Aristotle. You might know him. When he was eight years old, his father gave him a very mighty horse. It was huge. It was mighty, and it was mean, and no one had ever ridden it. Ridden it. And the legend has it that Alexander mounted that giant of a horse, and after a furious battle, he broke it. And the rest of his life, he used that horse horse. He rode it into battle for the rest of his life. Alexander the Great. One of the first big cities that he destroyed was Troy. And while he was there, he took the treasured shield of Achilles. And he marched eastward with delusions of grandeur, of being the king over all the earth, the ruler of everything. When he conquered Egypt, he left behind a little city that they named Alexandra, Alexandria. And in fact, I think there was something like 12 or 16 different cities that he named Alexandria. So it can get kind of confusing of what we're talking about. When he was in Egypt, he had some coins minted with his likeness on those coins. And they were inscribed, Son of Zeus. That's how he pictured himself. Now, Daniel's description of this great goat empire matches the exploits of Alexander at several points. The Bible says that this empire rose from the west, which happened with Alexander. The Greek empire moved with great speed, not touching the ground, and that was one of the tactics that Alexander had. You didn't see him coming. The Greek empire had a notable horn, according to this vision. And certainly, Alexander the Great was a pretty notable ruler. The Greek empire had a famous war against the Media and Persian empires. The Bible says, I saw him confronting the ram. And there's a story in history about Alexander the Great with an army of 47,000 men defeating Darius, the king of Persia, who had an army at that time of 120,000 men. The Greek empire hated the Medo-Persian empire. The Bible describes that they came with furious power and moved with rage. The Greek empire conquered the empire, the Persian empire. The Bible says there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Alexander the Great marched some 20,000 miles as far east as the Indus River within 10 years. Amazing. The reign of this notable leader of the Greek Empire would be suddenly cut off, the Bible says. The large horn would be broken. And we know in history that Alexander the Great died, and he died of alcohol poisoning, by the way. Apparently, somebody put him to a challenge. They had this thing that was called the Hercules Bowl. Now, you know a little bit about who, who Hercules is. 
Now, imagine he's got a bowl. He's, it's going to be a big, heavy bowl. And he was challenged, Alexander the Great was challenged. They decided to fill this bowl up with liquor and wine and spirits and to see if he could drink it. Well, he drank the whole thing. So they filled it again. And he drank it a second time. And not long after, he died of alcohol poisoning. After the end of Alexander the Great's reign, the Greek Empire was divided into four different rulers. And as the Bible says, in place of it, four notable ones came up. So then we have in chapter 8 the prophecy of these four rulers, the four horns of the goat. Chapter 8, verse 8. Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds. They're described in verse number 22 this way. As for the broken horn and the four that stood in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its own power. Well, as we know, Alexander the Great would move from Macedonia all the way eastward and southward at great speed against his enemies. They didn't even see him coming. He enlarged the Grecian Empire as far as Egypt to the south and as far as India to the east. And when he died of his poisoning, his kingdom was divided among his four generals. Their names are Cassandra, who ruled over Greece, Lysimachus, who ruled over Asia Minor, which would be modern-day Turkey, Seleucus, who ruled over Israel and Syria and Babylonia, modern-day Iraq and Iran and Pakistan, and another general called Ptolemy, who ruled over Egypt, one of the many cities in Egypt, Alexandria. So then we have a little bit of a prophecy of this little goat horn that became great. Verse number nine. And out of them, that is out of these four great leaders, came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, that's referring to Israel, and it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and some of the stars. The nation of Israel were often referred to as God's stars to the ground, and he trampled them. And even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away in Jerusalem. And the place of his sanctuary was ta cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and to cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prosper, prospered. And you pick it up a little bit later in verse number 23, and it gives us a little bit more detail. In that latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors of, uh, have reached their fullness... A king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not of his own. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive, and he shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Throughout all of history, there have been many haters of Israel. You might remember Hitler. Even to this day, if you've been listening to the news, we've got this tiny little nation of Israel surrounded by enemies, some of them launching missiles, rockets, and drones. That's similar to what this little horn that became great, is doing. Verse 25, through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he shall exalt himself in his heart. 
He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes. But he shall be broken without human means. Now we already noted that the four generals who came into power after Alexander died, verse 9 tells us that out of one of those generals came a little horn, a little ruler, which grew exceedingly great. So this little horn, this little ruler, becomes what I call the goat, the greatest of all times, the greatest of the goats, the greatest from the goat nation, the greatest of all time. And who is he? Well, Daniel doesn't give his precise name, but historians of that time record the exploits of a man who happens to match what we read in Daniel's vision. Some of you might have this in your library. I don't know, maybe Joshua does. A, a guy named Flavius Josephus, born in 37 in AD, around the time of the death of Christ, born in Jerusalem. He was a Jewish priest. He was a scholar and he was a historian. And he wrote just many books about the history of the Jewish nation. And he identifies this little horn that became the greatest of all time as Antiochus Epiphanes, the tyrannical persecutor of Israel from 175 B.C. to 164 B.C. Relentless persecution of God's people. Now, if you happen to have sitting around your house a Catholic Bible, you'll find that it has 14 books called the Apocrypha included in it, sandwiched in between the Old Testament and New Testament. These, bo these books, of course, are not considered uh, inspired by God in any way, but these books, these 14 books, have an incredible amount of history of the Jewish people, going back to 400 B.C. to 200 B.C. And one of those books, called 2 Maccabees, identifies the goat, the greatest of all time goats, as Antiochus Epiphanes. So that's my triple a threat. The first A is Alexander the Great. The second is Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's not hard to see why Josephus and 2 Maccabees identify the little horn that became the greatest of all time, the greatest goat, as Antiochus Epiphanes. His recorded Exploits and persecution of the Jews match what we read in Daniel's vision. He forced the Jews, for example, to, agree, to adopt the Greek culture and all of its pagan deities. He sponsored these Greek athletic events where men performed naked. On one attack on Israel, he slaughtered 40,000 Jews. He hated them, as nations have since. He set up a statue of Zeus right in the temple. He made the Jews eat swine flesh. And you know what, how Jews feel about eating pork. He put a stop to the Jewish practice of circumcision, the very thing that identified them as God's people, he stopped it. And if he came across any kind of circumcised male babies, they were immediately put to death. And they were hung around the neck of their mothers. And their mothers were paraded through the streets of Jerusalem. Does this guy have a hate on for the Jews? He burned copies of the Torah, the Old Testament books. He killed anyone who he found that happened to have a copy of the Torah. He minted coins inscribed Theos Epiphanes, which means God manifest, God in the flesh. That's how he saw himself. And over his lifetime, he murdered over 80,000 
Jews. Antiochus Epiphanes came to be known as the Hitler of his times. So we come down to verse number 13. And this is how it reads. Then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one that said to the certain one who was speaking, How long? How long will be the vision concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Daniel wants to know how long. He wants to know how long these terrible attacks on God's people are going to last. And he's given two kind of time frames. The most immediate time frame is recorded in verse number 14. And he said to him, he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, some suggest that because the offerings were made twice a day, he's talking about 2,300 offerings, which would be spread out over a period of 1,150 days. That's the suggestion of some people. And the reason why they've come to that is that we know in history that Judas Maccabees, who re retook Jerusalem and reconsecrated the temple, he did that in 165 BC, which is approximately 1,150 days after Antiochus Epiphanes died of some sort of bowel disease. But the next verses, Daniel is given a second time frame. Verse 15. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of man, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Eula, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. And he said to me, quote, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Verse 18. Now, as he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood, be, stood me upright. And he said, quote, look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the later time of the indignation. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. So you'll notice in those verses that it refers to the time of the end, that it will happen in the later times, at a point in time, the end will be. And there's quite a few biblical scholars who see in these verses an event that had both an already and a not yet timeline. Something that was going to happen soon and something that would happen later. The prophecy that Daniel, from Daniel's perspective, has both this near fulfillment in this guy, Antiochus, but also a distant fulfillment. The already, the near fulfillment would come in the person of Antiochus, but the distant and later not yet fulfillment would come in a person called the Antichrist. And that's my third A in the story. Alexander the Great, Antiochus, and the Antichrist. And if you read Matthew chapter 24, and if you read, you know, what the words were from Jesus and from John and Paul, every one of them used Daniel chapter 8 to point to the Antichrist. So Antiochus, Epiphanes, becomes kind of like a junior antichrist, a type of the antichrist, a figure that foreshadows a distant antichrist. And if you think he was bad, and if you think he was mean, and if you think he hated the Jews, you ain't seen nothing yet. 
Because the Antichrist of the last days will do a thousand times more harm to God's people than he ever did. No wonder in verse 27, Daniel fainted and was sick to his stomach for days about this vision. How long, O oh Lord? How long will the adversary reproach us? How long will the wicked triumph? Psalm 94, 3. Revelation 6, 10. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge your blood of those who dwell on the earth? How long? Well, that kind of depends. Exodus chapter 10, 3. How long will you refuse to humble yourself? Exodus 16, 28. How long do you refuse to keep my commandments? Numbers 14, 11, How long will these people reject me? Numbers 14, 17. How long shall I bear this evil congregation who complain against me? 1 Kings 18, 21. How long will you falter between two opinions? Maybe there's a reason why God is waiting for such a long time. He's giving us a chance to repent. And we must not forget that our circumstances, the circumstances that you live in today, as difficult as they may be, they do not counteract the eternal truth that our God sits on the throne. A triple threat. Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, and the Antichrist. But you need to know that all of them will be destroyed by the fourth A, the Ancient of Days. We're going to sing this in a moment. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid rock, firm from the fiercest drought and storm. How long, O Lord? Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Father, we thank you for this incredible vision, and we pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to be ready for that day. We thank you for your incredible mercy and your patience for us. Give us hope in the meantime. May we hang on to the fact that no matter how bad things get, the eternal God still sits on the throne. We pray in Jesus' name.